the notion of this Genesis chapter 1. So he sees all these church fathers saying very, very different things about Genesis chapter 1, and he loves the church fathers. And he doesn't want to tell any of the church fathers that they're wrong. So he tries his best to make sense of all that they're doing and see how are they actually fitting together and working in the same direction. So yes, there are disagreements, but we can't say for sure that any of them are wrong. There's a way in which they all kind of make sense in their own way. He has his, sort of, his own personal thoughts on it, but he's trying to do respect to the fathers, but also show the way that there is coherence about certain theological truths. Thus, concerning the beginning of the world, there is something that pertains to the substance of the faith. Not simply, this is, this, is, this is the substance of the faith, not simply other aspects of Scripture that we're trying to understand how it fits together. Namely, that the created world had a beginning, and all the fathers agree on this. But how it began and in what order it was made pertain to the faith only accidentally, insofar as these opinions are handed on in Scripture, whose truth the fathers, holding diverse opinions, handed on by diverse explanations. So there is a unity in the Fathers around, first and foremost, the idea of the, the, the fact of creation by God. And then a diversity about the details of that fact, the details of how that fact worked out. And so, Augustine, or so, so seeing this in Augustine, seeing this in all the Fathers, Aquinas is encouraging us to, to be sure that we center on those, those central truths of the Scripture, and then not be, you know, be, be open to the possibility of a variety of ways to bring together our understanding of the, uh, the, the ancillary aspects of the scripture and how that message that was, that was inspired in the author speaks in his own context and in our context, in our lives. So what, for example, are some of those truths that we might see in, uh, so we mentioned the motion of creation. I think some others that we can see is that there is something of order in the created world. All of the church fathers talk about it. The, the beauty and order that comes out of creation. And we see this not simply in Genesis chapter 1, but in lots of other passages of Scripture. It is confirmed over and over that there is, there is a wisdom and order to the way that God created. That there is a goodness in the creation. God saw that it was good. And this, again, is confirmed over and over in many other places in Scripture. And something about the place of man, the place of humanity in the Scriptures. And this, too, comes out in many other places. These are some of the truths around which we can center and root our understanding of the faith, our, under our understanding of these passages of Scripture, as we try to understand how they fit into a broader context of our understanding of, of, of cosmology, of, uh, of evolution, of all sorts of different scientific advances. Okay, so the Fathers read the Scripture in a broad way. Great. What evolution has done more than just simply made, uh, made the question about how to read Scripture kind of odd, I mean, evolution is saying that it know that it has a theory for every single step that happened from the first little paramecium all the way up to I don't know actually the first thing I'm not a biologist sorry whatever the first thing was uh, working its way all the way up to man and there are no gaps every single step is is part of this biological process and not only that it's a random process all sorts of crazy stuff is happening who knows what's going to come out next this is this is this is the theory of evolution and. Where exactly is your God in that? Where does God fit into this, this picture of this smooth process that is, that, is, that, that is fairly well understood in many ways, that we can have a reasonable explanation for how all these things fit together? This is where the philosophical point comes in. Because this, too, is uh, a, a common misconception about the relationship of God and creation. So to, to illustrate this, I, I want to tell a story. A little bit. Well, a specific story, actually, which is dangerous because I'm a physicist and I'm going to be quoting English literature. Um, I want to talk about Hamlet. Um, so, Hamlet, Act 5. Sorry, spoiler, my bad. Um, Hamlet, as he has been poisoned, as he has as been stabbed and poisoned, learns finally that it is his uncle Claudius who has been behind everything and has been seeking his own death and seeking to seal the throne. And in a fit of rage and in, 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 in just anger, he goes and he stabs his, un his uncle Claudius and kills him. Why did Hamlet stab Claudius? Was it because Hamlet was so built up with anger and just anger that he had this, this, this strong will to, to seek vengeance on this, 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 this cause of his misery 
And he reaches out and stabs Claudius. Is that why Hamlet stabbed Claudius? Or is it because William Shakespeare wrote the play so that Hamlet would stab Claudius? It's kind of an odd question in a certain sense. And in fact, there's something that's kind of silly about it. I mean, we're talking on, on different levels here, right? So yes, Hamlet's, like, if Shakespeare hadn't sat down and wrote Hamlet, then, then Hamlet would never have stabbed Claudius, at least not in the play Shakespeare. Uh, or, sorry, the play, play Hamlet by Shakespeare. So, so clearly, if, if, if Shakespeare's not there doing something, Hamlet's not doing anything either. And yet, in the context of the play, in the context of the, 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 the story play, does it really even matter that Shakespeare's there? In the context of the development of the story, in the context of the, the, the anger and frustration of Hamlet as he reaches out in rage to stab his uncle, does it matter that Shakespeare's there? In a certain sense, no. In that context, it's perfectly understandable the actions of Hamlet as, as a character in this story. And that's how we first experience it. We don't sit there immediately thinking about Shakespeare until your English teacher comes in and tells you to think about Shakespeare. Uh, that first reaction is that Hamlet is, is angry, and justly so. This is an analogy, but like all analogies, a limping analogy, for something in the way in which traditionally Christians and Catholics have thought about the relationship of God to the natural order. Our first experience of the world is of the things around us, of this podium, of this glass of water, which I'm going to take a drink from right now. <laughs> Um, of, of, of interactions and speeches, of, of the, this, this is our experience of things. This is, this is what we're so used to. And yet, this, is, this experience is not devoid of God. This natural order is not somehow devoid of God. In fact, this natural order would not be here if not for God. And not simply in the, in the sense of Genesis chapter 1. That if there wasn't some date, whether it was 6,000 or 14.8 billion years ago, when, when God created the, the, the universe, it's not simply the fact that, yeah, back then God did something and then just stuff happened. That if God was not actively working right now, if God wasn't thinking about each and every one of you, if God wasn't loving each and every one of you right now, you would stop to exist. That is, that is the Christian understanding of the created order. That everything that exists is held in being by God. Creation is not simply a time in the past that happened. Creation is something that is happening right now. My very ability to stand here to speak to you, speak probably too loudly and too quickly, is given to me in this very moment by God. My desire to be here, my ability to think and process and try to make sure I'm keeping track of the time, that is all given to me by God. And only exist because God is actively giving me the powers by which I have, first, first my body, my mind, my, uh, my, my intellectual, my, my spiritual soul, like all of these things that are, he is, he is actively holding them in existence and allowing me, giving me the power to use them and to work them in a way that allows me to speak to you. All of this is creation right now. This is the Catholic understanding of how creation works, of the notion of God's activity in the world. The fact, that, the fact that there is order, that there is structure, that there is beauty, that there is just the normal ordering of things, the fact that, that things tend to do things, the fact that we can actually predict patterns and see how, how apple trees tend to make apples, which seem to make apple trees, which make more apples. That is not a sign that God does not exist. That is, in fact, in of itself, a sign that God does exist. Because, philosophically speaking, that apple tree could make a tiger. That apple tree could make a dragon. That apple tree could make a stone. There's, there's a way in which we can... I, just think of that. Think of an apple tree with a tiger hanging off of it. We can imagine what that would look like. There's a way in which that's not a complete philosophical impossibility. The very nation notion of order and structure in the world itself needs explanation. And it is God, not simply as designer back in the day, but is God acting right now that is holding all of that order and structure and keeping it going. You can see this brought out most beautifully by St. Thomas Aquinas in, in, his, uh, in the Summa Theologian. So this is the... Uh, so in part three, so part three um, the first quote. So he, there's two quotes here, very similar, 
about God's providence and God's governance. Providence being the notion that God knows and has ordered all things in existence according to his, and according to his wisdom so that they work out for the good. So the effect, the effect of divine providence is not only that things should happen somehow, but that they should happen either by necessity or by contingency. He's talking about the question of, okay, if God, so, if God has providence over everything, then is everything absolutely necessary? Do things have to have happened that way? Do things, are things, uh, um, is there any actual such thing as chance in the world? If God actually knows and has ordered all things, then, then chance seems to make no sense. And he says, divine problems is not enough that things should happen somehow, but that they should happen either by necessity or by contingency. Therefore, whatsoever divine providence ordains to happen infallibly and of necessity happens. Infallibly and of necessity. The nature of the thing, that if, if it is absolutely necessary that this follow that, then that is, the, if, if it is in God's providence that, that this must follow that, then this will follow that. And, that. and that which happens from contingency, which the plan of divine providence conceives to happen from contingency. God is so powerful, goes so powerful in his creativity and in his, in his knowledge of the created order and in his power over the created order that he gives the power for things to happen randomly, for things to happen contingently, and yet still fit into his providential order. This is weird. The first time you think of this is like, mm, this is odd. I'm not going to say it's not. But it's also not new. This is, first off, this is St. Thomas talking about randomness back in the 13th century and dates back to, to the 14th century. This is something the Catholics had thought about for a long time. Not because they were thinking about evolution. In fact, not really because they were thinking about randomness at all. But because they were thinking deeply and seriously about free will. Because if God has providence over everything, if God is the one who, is, who has holding me in existence and giving me the power to speak to you today, am I the one speaking to you or not? There's a way in which we have had to, as Christians, balance this wonderful view of God as provident, loving, ordering God, and the absolute necessity of the idea of free will to make sense of our understanding of salvation history. Free will is that which has led us into sin. Free will, most especially the free will of our Lord Jesus Christ, is what has led us out of sin. And it is by bringing our will into line with the will of God, the will of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we too can be saved. And so if we are not actually free, then this is just God playing with adults. And that is not Christianity. That is not our understanding of the world. So we there is a, a deep and robust reflection over the course of, of Christian history over how it is that God's providence, how this all-knowing, all-loving God can order the world and yet still give things the power to be free. And even more, in, in a similar way, give things the power to, to be accidental and happenstance and, and chance. These are, these are difficult philosophical notions, but this is not a new notion. This is not some reaction to modern science. This is something that dates back, again, to the Church Fathers. And so, so we see that there is um, this, this philosophical principle puts a lie to the idea, this idea of God's providence, and God's providence over everything, even if it seems and is on our level, on our experience of things, actually random, even actually free. It truly is actually free, or truly is actually random. It is not outside of God's providence and God's creative power. So when we speak of biological evolution, the simple fact that we can, we can name step by step by step the simple fact that, that, that there is randomness going on in this does not take this outside of the realm of God's creative power. And arguably, understood in the right light, points towards God as a wonderful and ordering creator. Okay, so God is working the natural world. So what do we just you know, say, whatever biology says, okay, God did that, sure, why not? So the biologist will do this, fine, God did it, great. Uh, and then we'll just sort of like play with scripture until we make it work, and that's it, that's great. 
uh, here is where the theological point comes in. I mean, I mentioned, uh, and I particularly, so I mentioned this a little bit in the context of Genesis chapter 1 and the notion of, of God's creative activity. But let's bring this down to, to what actually the more, the more difficult question, the, the question of, of man, the question of the human person and the, 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 and, and the creation of, of the human person. How is it that we understand this in the context of biological evolution? Um, and I want to take a little point. What is the theological boundaries upon which this conversation can happen? How is it, what, what are the sort of the non-negotiables that come out in part in Genesis chapter 2? Uh, and in several of the other sort of stories of creations and, and discussions of man in the scriptures. Well, here is where, when the church has said something sort of specific on evolution, this is where uh, um, uh, it, it has tended to focus, because this is, in a certain sense, where the rubber hits the road. And so I want to look at uh, uh, two quotes um, from, or a quote from Pope Pius XII in 1950, and then a, a quote from more recently, in 2004. So this is, this is in Humana Generis, uh, where, where the Pope, uh, Pope, Pope Pius XII back in 1950 was speaking about just sort of new theories and ideas that were inimical to the Catholic faith, or at least sort of seemed dangerous. How are we supposed to deal with these? And one of the ones that he talks about in evolution. And he says that there can and should be, uh, among those who understand the biology and the philosophy and the theology, there should be a robust conversation about evolution. Must trying to understand how to integrate the biology and the, and, and the philosophy and, and the theology. But he makes a, a slight warning, because he, he turns and talks specifically about a particular part in theory of evolution, um, which I think I cut that sentence off, but it, it's referred to as polygenism, uh, which is the, uh, the, uh, a theory related to the idea that, that, there, you know, that rather than monogenism, that we came from one set of parents, we came from a community, a, a larger set of parents. Um, and so he says, so the faithful cannot embrace that opinion, which maintains that either Adam, either after Adam there existed on this earth true men who did not take their origin from natural generation from him, as from his first parent of all, or that Adam represented a certain number of first parents. Now it is no way apparent how such an opinion can be reconciled with that which the sources of revealed truth, the documents, the teaching authority of the church, propose with regard to original sin. So he is saying that this particular idea that is out there is in somehow inimical and, un, and, and, and it's not clear to his own mind and to those he's, 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 he's come to realize how you could possibly bring these things together. But it's important to understand the context, historical context, around which this, this, this document was written as well. Because what is the particular theory of polygenism that was being espoused in that day, in 1950, when Pope Pius XII wrote this, wrote this document? It is a theory that that was, that was one of and, and one of the popular theories of the origin of man at the time. That the human person had evolved independently in several parts of the world. So in Asia, Africa, Europe, uh, the Americas, like independently around the same time, but not at the exact same time, there was independent evolution from some, some, some precursor, some non-human species, into the human species. And if we say that, if we think that, that we as humanity are, in fact, different animals with different origins that have come together to form this, this conglomeration of things that we call humanity, but in fact have actually different origins and different sources, then it is hard to understand the unity of our experience of original sin. The unity of that act that brings us together as sinners, and then to understand the unity of the act by which our Lord Jesus Christ redeemed us from sin. Because the way that God chose to redeem us in his wisdom was to send our Lord Jesus Christ to take on a human nature. And it is the human nature that he shares with all people. But if people came to be at different times from different species, from different places, from different, in a different way, is there really one people? Is there really one human nature that can be assumed by Christ by which we can all be saved? Which of those six strings did he come out of? Now, the thing is, that's not the theory of human origins that we talk about today. It turns out, when we come to understand uh, the, the genetics behind, uh, behind evolution, we understand DNA and, and, and the, the details of genetics, we have come to realize that that theory was, was flawed and false. 